I'm showing everyone. Welcome to worship. We're uh, trying to get our, our online presence going over here. Our regular presence isn't working from the back and all the good equipment that we have, so we're back on a, uh, a phone over here. Uh, seems to be the, the question on everyone's mind, or at least many, is how is Kay doing? And I want to let you know she's home. The surgery went well. Uh, everything was benign. Uh, she's Resting and uh, still, still not great, but doing a little bit better every day. So, thank you for all your thoughts and prayers on that. Well, let us worship God. Because of God's goodness, we will tell God's story to family and friends. We will offer praise in the midst of the congregation. Let us raise our hallelujahs together as God's people. Because God has never turned away. God is always available to listen and is but a breath away whenever we cry out for help. So in the presence of the congregation, we raise our voices in praise and honor you, God. Let us pray. <clears throat> Loving God, as we walk through this beautiful day, may we walk with you. Show us that there is still wonder in this world. Open our eyes to the blessings all around us. If we would just look. Remind us that there are kind and loving people in our lives who care for us deeply 
and for whom we care as well. Lighten our steps and lead us toward a future of hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
hanging in the choir. That was beautiful. Our responsive reading is from Psalm 104, which points out that the God of all creation is worthy of our praise. Please join me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, the Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. Wrapped in light, blessed in the garden, you stretch out the heavens like a tent. You set the beams of your chambers on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride in the wings of the wind. You make the wings your messengers. Fire and flame your ministers. You set the earth on its foundations so that it shall never be shaken. You cover it with the deep as I said the arm. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they flee. At the sound of your thunder they take to flight. They rose up to the mountains, and ran down to the valleys, to the place they were looking for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. Oh, oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Let that sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Our scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, beginning at verse 35. Hear the word of God. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him, that is to Jesus, and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left hand is not mine to drink, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones of tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. That ends our lesson. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Did you play games growing up? We did as a family, especially a lot of cards. I learned to play Crazy Eights, Canasta, and war, and some of us in junior high followed the example of our mothers and learned to play bridge, which they did in their club. It's a tough game to learn and master. We kids in our neighborhood played a lot of board games like Risk and Monopoly and Life and Trouble and Cheesy. Outside, we played kickball and tag and even some frisbee. What games did you play when you grew up? And in our story, in the scripture lesson this morning, we hear that the disciples like to play games as well. I'd like to look a little at how Jesus, once again, turns the tables on his disciples, and on us, by moving them from the game that they wanted to play into a game of his own, where he sets the rules. The situation that we don't 
hear about in our reading is that just before this, Jesus has taken the disciples aside and explained to them that he is headed towards Jerusalem. That he is going to be headed there in order to fulfill his ministry and end his ministry in torture and in death. And as soon as he's finished announcing this, this somber thing to them, James and John ask Jesus if they can sit at his right hand and his left hand when he comes into his power in the kingdom. They're, they're playing a game that's been handed down to them by others called power trick. I'm pretty sure that they didn't really listen closely when he explained what he was trying to tell them. I picture Jesus stopping on the side of the road for a break, his mouth kind of drawn tight as he tells his disciples together and explains to them what's down the road for him. Except that he, while he's telling them about all these somber things. Two of his disciples are shifting their feet, wanting to, to get up there and tell Jesus. They're thinking about what they want to say so much that they really don't hear him. And as the other disciples drift away to ponder this news that he's just given them, the sons of Zebedee step forward, and without further thought to what he has just said, they bring their proposal to the Lord. They were making plans to sit at his right and his left hand once the kingdom is attained. And they bring this idea to Jesus. When Jesus speaks of his kingdom and heading to Jerusalem, the capital city of power, James and John begin to want to play the power game. And as soon as the other ten hear what James and John are talking about, they get a bit indignant. And they jump in and want to play the game also. The disciples are trying to get Jesus to follow along with the rules of their power game. And stops them. First, he names what assumptions they're working under so that they can step back and see it themselves. Then he tells them that that's not the only game in town. And he spells out the rules to a different way of life. And there's only actually one rule that Jesus gives. The one rule of the game of life that Jesus gives the disciples is to serve. He says that he knows our natural instinct is to try to gain power over others. Points out that their rulers lord it over them and are tyrants. Most of our games that we play have some of the similar theme running through it. Whether it's parenting or marriage, hanging out with friends or working with associates. We're in a small or large way competing with them. We often want to try and one-up them or win the game of being right. Try to let them know who's the boss at times. Jesus turns that concept on its head and says that to be first, you must look for ways to place the needs of others before yourself. That's the rule. To be great, you have to serve others. That's it. Serve others. Interestingly, he doesn't say anything in here about church attendance or offerings or fasting or any of those other things that we have to do with church. Many of those ways have been proven helpful in serving, but they are not the rule. The rule is serving others. Keep in mind that these are not pious gibberings from a, a remote holy man. Jesus doesn't just preach this, but he lives it. He serves. He veils his greatness and performs God's will even to death. Serve others. It shuts up the disciples and certainly gives us something to think about. If we are followers of Christ, the only rule is to serve others. During World War II, England desperately needed to increase its production of coal. And so Winston Churchill called together labor leaders from the mines to enlist their support. At the end of his presentation, he asked them to picture in their minds a parade that he knew would be held in downtown London after the war was over. First, he said, would come the sailors who had kept the vital sea lanes open. Then he said, would come the soldiers who had come home from Dunkirk and gone on to defeat Rommel in Africa. 
Then would come the pilot who had driven the Luftwaffe out of the sky. Last of all, he said, would come a long line of sweat-stained, soot-soaked men in miners' cap. And someone from the crowd would cry out to them, and where were you during the critical days of our struggle? From 10,000 throats would come the answer, we were deep in the earth with our faces to the cold. Just as those miners were able to serve their country by doing hidden work that wasn't front and center the way the others' service was, so with Christ, he doesn't want his followers to sit at his right and his left hands for all to see, but instead wants those willing to do the necessary nitty-gritty. So with that rule of service in mind, let me share just two thoughts on that rule. The first is that by accepting the rule, that means we accept the one who gives the rule. In many ways, there are many who have lived lives of service, but who have done so for a variety of reasons. Whether with a service group, or on a fundraising walk, or at a 4-H meeting, or on a school board, we meet many who are serving their community. The actions of many may be the same, but the motivation, the what, or in this case, the who, who stands behind it, is the motivation that counts for us. To accept the rule from Christ that we serve is also to accept Christ as the ruler. And in accepting Christ as the rule giver, we need to play the game by his rules. We did a Lenten study a while back using Richard Foster's book, Celebration of Discipline, and in it he writes about the difference between those who serve with self-righteousness and those who serve in Christ's name. He wrote, self-righteous service comes through human effort. True service comes from a relationship with the divine other deep inside. Self-righteous service is impressed with the big deal. True service finds, it's all, finds it almost impossible to distinguish the small from large service. Self-righteous service requires external rewards. True service rests in contented happiness. Self-righteous service is highly concerned about results. True service is free of the need to calculate results. Self-righteous service picks and chooses whom to serve. True service is indiscriminate in its ministry. Self-righteous service is affected by moods and whims. True service ministers simply and faithfully because there is a need. Self-righteous service is temporary. True service is a lifestyle. Self-righteous service is without sensitivity. It insists on meeting the need even when to do so would be destructive. True service can withhold the service as freely as perform it. Self-righteous service fractures community. True service, on the other hand, builds community. To follow Jesus' game of service means to play the game his way. Second is that we know that the results of Jesus' service to others is that after his pronouncement to his disciples of torture and death down the road, and that that prediction came true, so when the bad times come, when there's pushback to us trying to serve, don't say that you weren't born. Service is not always rewarded positively. But we also know that Easter followed the cross, and that tells us something about who has the final word. Other games may offer happiness, or success, or power. And just when you think you're about to reach one of those goals, you find out that, no, you have to play it a little bit more, a little bit more. The game of life played by Christ's rule of service offers inner peace, which is much more satisfying, and it's there no matter what the circumstances. The disciples were looking to play the wrong game. They wanted a conqueror to lead them into power and prestige, perhaps even wealth, and instead got a servant leader who allowed himself to be broken on a cross. 
They were looking for the haughty line of Judah, and instead they received the meek Lamb of God. There are lots of games we can play, both for fun or like the disciples to play for power and fame. But let's remember that there is a different game in town, which doesn't promise glamour, but instead offers satisfaction and peace of mind. Christ's game doesn't offer power, but puts you on the side of the one who has all the power in the universe. Christ's game doesn't offer success, but it offers you the God of love who can take any successes you have or any failures you have and turn them into something beautiful and everlastingly worthwhile. The game Christ offers is simply to serve others on his behalf. It sounds like a game that's worthy to be played, so let's game on. Let us play. Pray. Let us, let us play. No, let us play. Pray. <laughs> o Lord, the great and the small, we remember that you created us and for a purpose. Show each of us a little more of your will for our lives and how each of us can follow you by serving others. Grant us peace along the way. For we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen.
Um, I don't believe we have yet to hit a time uh, when we've had more in the sanctuary than we have online. So uh, it looks like we're getting close. I have a few announcements to bring to your attention, and that is that uh, right after our worship, uh, we're going to head up to many of us. We're going to head up to Frankfurt for the ALS walk, and uh, we're going to support Donna and Roy up there. They're going to have lunch afterwards, so we hope that you'll join us. Uh, back here at 11.30, the community's little helpers are going to be having their gathering. Uh, the kids are going to wear costumes, and they're going to go around town with bags of candy to give to the people in their houses. It's kind of a reverse Halloween. The kids in costume are giving out candy because they know Branchville uh, citizens have to give out hundreds of uh, pieces of candy. Last I heard, like 900 kids come to town. Uh, it's next Saturday afternoon sometime, so today our kids are giving out uh, candy. We'll be giving out later. And then at 3 o'clock, we're heading up to the Roman Catholic Church in Sussex for the silent movie Phantom of the Opera. Uh, John Barada is going to be playing the organ to the silent movie, so that should be fun. We are still collecting uh, different things for the college care packages. Those are going to be going out sometime next week, so there's really just uh, this week and next Sunday to bring in more donations. I think we have about 15 youth who are over in uh, their colleges, and we want to send them something to uh, kind of get them through this midterm. Uh, we're also going to try and do Halloween here at the church on the uh, 30th. It's Saturday, not the 31st. And uh, we're going to need some candy to give out. So if you want to bring in a bag of candy or two or a ten, uh, we, we wouldn't mind. Well, let's take a little bit of time now to offer our prayers in silence for all those people that are laying on our hearts and on our minds. And uh, then in, after the silence, I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, knowing all too well that today's problems are enough for today, we entrust to your compassionate care all the burdens we're too tired to carry, the worries we no longer want to bear. Take from us any anxieties that threaten to overwhelm us, the grief of cumulative losses, the, the fear for our well-being and that of those we love, the doubts that prevent us from moving forward. We hand them over, trusting that your spirit intercedes for us and translates our sighs too deep for words into prayers that you lovingly respond to. Merciful God, you never abandon us. Your faithfulness to the covenant you make with your people is unwavering. You walk with us, go before us, and envelop us warmly with your goodness and grace. Help us to feel your close presence with every breath in each heartbeat. May our awareness of your nearness empower us to do justice and love kindness and keep walking with you so that others will come to know your love through our witness. Make of us grateful, joy-filled people, a light to which others are drawn. Glorious Lord, we're told only to ask and that in asking we will receive. We ask now for whatever tongues on our hearts, weighs on our minds, calls from our souls. So hear us as we pray for Kay that she will do well in her recovery. For Linda and Ed Hoskins, the Widder's family, Heather and Grace. We pray a quick recovery for Anthony Kavita and strength to his wife Sarah. We ask you to be with Charles Krug's mother Audrey. He was Sylvia Datchison and Karen, Irene and Sherry, Sharon Smith's 
father after her passing, Sharon Smith's family after her passing, and Betty Ann Moore after her spinal surgery. Be with the Weber family, and the Tater family, the family of Viv Braun, Anthony Caserta, John Smith, the Bond family, and all those suffering from COVID. May they recover. Also, Gabe T and his family, Lewis, Robert, family and friends of John Arnett, Virginia and Vera, Dennis Sensale Jr., Elsa Leo, Liz, Sawyer Long, Judy, Evelyn, Tom, Kathy, and Megan, and all those we have named in the silence. Here are our prayers this morning in loving response, Lord. And hear our prayer as we offer to you the one that you taught us when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our God trusts us to be his agents of change in this world, so that we respond to God's generosity in the sharing of our time, toil, and treasure. Those at home may use one of the ways listed in the bulletin, and those here in the sanctuary may use the place that will be best to make their offering. Thank you.
Help us to use them to serve your church and your people. We pray this in 